for a raffle. We're gonna be raffling off three of these baskets. These are all items that are grown or made in the Imperial Valley at the end of this session. And Mr. Jesus Escobar, supervisor for Imperial County will be doing that. But we're gonna do a, a drawing at this time. Those that came by the Dom Team's booth uh, throughout the day, dropped a card in here. We're going to have two, two raffles right now. This is Marisa Kelly. She works for Doug Dom. D Doug knows dirt, so please stop by their booth. And she's going to pull a couple, a uh, couple uh, tickets out of here. So don't need to be present to win. But I'll go ahead and announce those names. And I know this person very well, Monique North, one of our actually our project of the year for Imperial County Ventura transfer. And uh, we will be delivering her a gift card for $50 plus a bottle of wine. Congratulations, Monique North with Ventura Transfer Company. And that's Monique coming up. If, you're in the, if you have an interest in transporting liquids or solids by rail or by truck, please contact Ventura Transfer. Monique, congratulations. There you go. All right. And thank you mate, for making your investment in the Imperial County. So the next, <laughs> the next one we have, uh, drawn by Marisa Kelly, for a bottle of Zinfandel and a $50 gift certificate for Applebee's, is Chairman of the Board of Supervisors, Ryan E. Kelly, drawn by Marisa Kelly, um, presented by Tim Kelly, and I know that it'll be eaten and drank by Robin Kelly. Right, Robin? Yeah. How does that stuff happen, Ryan? Ryan says, don't accept this, but Robin says, forget it, Ryan. Robin said she wants it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so remember, I wanna thank uh, the, the Dom team and all of our exhibitors today, and I wanna introduce you to Jesus Escobar, uh, supervisor for the Imperial County, a long-term member of IVDC, and a big supporter of economic development in this county. And he'll go ahead and introduce his panel. Uh, remember, five o'clock, we're going to raffle off three baskets sponsored by the Imperial County of items made, grown in the Imperial County, and then we'll be having a reception from five to seven. Thank you. There you go, Jesus. We missing a couple people. Oh, wonderful, Mr. Webster, come on up. I don't have bios on on them, so I will let them introduce themselves. Jeff Birch from Bank of the West. Oh, you want me to go now? And Mr. Brian Webster from California Hemp. But I'll I'll let them introduce themselves. Go ahead. All right. Hi everybody. My name is Jeff Birch. Uh, I work for Bank of the West in our food and ag group. Um, and as far as I know, we're the only major commercial bank in the United States banking hemp and CBD. We've been doing it since Trump signed the Farm Bill. And right now I would say we probably have about 500 clients across the country, somewhere between doing hemp seed genetics, um, growing hemp, processing hemp, uh, vertically integrated companies, companies that are buying CBD and using it as an ingredient for some product or healthcare product that they're selling. So since January, we've been handling all the depository needs and uh, all the online banking, wires, ACHs, all the things that a cannabis company hasn't been able to do, or at least now that it's legal, we're doing it for the, the hemp and CBD space. So. Uh, we're a very large ag bank, and we uh, watch the farm bill very closely. So I heard someone earlier on a panel say, you know, bankers don't understand the difference between hemp and marijuana. And um, if, you're, if you're an ag banker and uh, 
you're part of a global bank. We bank it in other countries. So we, we do business in 72 countries and we bank cannabis, all forms, in, the, in a lot of those countries where it's legal. So it wasn't a big step for us to make to once, uh, once it got signed in December to just open up and start helping people with not having to operate with cash all the time. So um, that's my intro and why I'm here. Thank you, Jeff. Before I introduce Mr. Brian Webster, uh, Paul from Mechanics Bank, uh, Chris from California, I mean, Farm Credit, you want to come up here? Because he did say he's the only banker in the nation. Come on, you guys, we're challenging you. Come on, we want more money. Sorry, I had to go there. Mr. Webster, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Um, howdy, folks. I am Brian Webster. Uh, I have a specialized uh, hemp uh, practice called CA Hemp or CA Hemp. I am a community organizer, professional community organizer, professional business development guy, and an event producer. And one of the events that I produce is called the California Hemp Investment Forum. And it brings together investors and hemp entrepreneurs and farmers to. Um, invest in this new green sustainable industry that we have going here now in California. And so I'm here to talk a little bit about the market and the uh, investment market, also, you know, the investment opportunities, because it's just, you know, there's gonna be a lot of jobs and a lot of revenue and a lot of money for a lot of people in this, in this new industry. Thank you, Brian. Uh, first question, from a financing perspective, and we'll get into the maybe the venture capital perspective in a couple seconds. From a financing perspective, I have a 600-acre plot of land. I want to grow hemp as opposed to alfalfa, hypothetically. What are the dynamics that would separate one crop with the other from a lending perspective? Well, from, from a banking perspective, the challenge that I think from talking to farm credit and other institutions that are in the space is all the uncertainties that are surrounding the sector right now. We got legislative changes happening daily. We've got prices changing daily as, you know, products are getting harvested and prices are coming down. Um, we've got most growers growing the crop for the first time uh, and learning a lot doing it. Um, so right now I think it's, it's very challenging for a traditional bank to be able to step into the sector and, and finance your scenario if, if the client is going to take all 600 acres and switch from alfalfa to hemp. Now, now that said, we're not seeing that scenario today. What we've been seeing is, uh, in many cases, we'll have a, I mean, to use your example, we'll have a 600 acre alfalfa farm that decides to take 10 acres and experiment with hemp. And from a financing perspective, I guess we as a bank um, wouldn't have a problem with that. And the reason I say that is that if when we look, the way we look at doing crop financing is we're looking at what's the cost to get the crop in the ground and get it harvested and sold and then we're, we're comparing that to what revenue projection is expected from the total crops that they're gonna be selling. And so in, your, in my scenario, if they did take 10 acres to experiment with hemp, we would look at it and say, okay, planting the 590 acres of alfalfa and 10 acres of hemp, what are your total expenses? Or what debt do you want to use to get that crop in the ground and get it finished out. And then as long as we can look at the uh, alfalfa only projected income, and as long as that income is sufficient to service all the debt, then we're okay with a farmer putting in 10 acres of hemp because we as a bank aren't betting on the farmer's ability to get that crop grown, to get the yield he thinks he's gonna get, to get the price he thinks he's gonna get, and hopefully it doesn't get too hot and an ag commissioner tells them to plow it under. So 
um, or the regulations don't change somewhere along the line because a county or city or, or state decides we need more time to think about something. Thank you, Jeff. Brian, do you want to add any, any uh, thoughts to that question? Uh, yeah, sure. So the, the main thing is that there really is two kinds of hemp. Right? One is industrial hemp. It grows long and tall like bamboo. Uh, and it is, you know, it, it grows like hay or alfalfa. And while a farmer can get, my understanding is a farmer can get $500 or $1,000 an acre from hay or alfalfa, he can get, or he or she can get $1,500 an acre from industrial hemp that is grown for seed or fiber. But the other kind of hemp is the CBD hemp. And that is, doesn't look like hay or alfalfa. It's grown three feet apart, and it looks like short, bush, bulky Christmas trees. And from that, farmers get twenty to $30,000 an acre in revenue. So the thing about hemp in California this year is that 99% of all the hemp in California is CBD hemp growing this year. And while five, 10 years from now, 90% uh, of the hemp will be um, industrial hemp and 10% will be CBD hemp. For right now, it's practically all CBD hemp because, because of the money, because of the revenue that it's uh, there for the, for the farmers. And then it's uh, a tremendous investment opportunities. Farmers can go to investors and they say, okay, we need financing, we need equipment, we need, you know, this, we got overhead and expenses and we're expecting to bring in Twenty to thirty thousand dollars in revenue. There's, I mean, it's it's a little complicated. It's based on the CBD level and things like that. But you can get, you know, uh, angel investors. You can get institutional investors. I really haven't heard of, you know, banks. But the, you know, I'm a big fan of the Bank of the West because you can actually go there and open up an account. You know, if you're if somebody will give you, you know, a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or something, you can go to the Bank of the West and put it in the bank you know, and then do business. But uh, there's plenty of money to be made in growing hemp and C particularly CBD hemp. And there's plenty of, uh, you know, investors that know about it. They're just looking for farmers that know how to farm. People have land. I pre appreciate that. Let me, let me take it to the next level on that specific, and I'll, I'll let you respond as well. Uh, because you touched upon a little bit, and I'm hoping we can delve a little deeper into the angel investor, the venture capitalist that's looking to obviously return on their investment, especially from a CBD oil perspective. Can you touch upon that as far as what that market is? Uh, Brian, and obviously Jeff, uh, you can definitely chime in as well. The market for angel investors, venture capitalists, specifically in the CBD oil aftermarket, but from a farming perspective. Okay, so there is a, the, um the thing about CBD hemp is basically it's the same as this product called medical marijuana, which is very mature here in California. Medical marijuana has been grown and sold in California for, for many, many years. And since 2018, it's been regulated uh, and licensed. Uh, but basically, you take medical marijuana plant and you reduce the THC level down to point, less than 0.3%. And then, because it's a, basically a political designation, it becomes hemp. It becomes legally a legal crop coast to coast in the United States of America. And it's regulated through the California Department of Food and Agriculture. So the, um, um, they are, the medical marijuana people are paying lots and lots of money in licensing and fees, and they can only grow a quarter of an acre of their medical marijuana, which the, the value is the CBD molecule, the CBD element in it. So there's all kinds of people migrating from the medical marijuana industry into the CBD hemp industry because it's less taxes and less regulation. So there's a, a pretty mature investment community also that has been investing in cannabis and marijuana startup businesses. One angel investment group is called the Arcview Group. 
Uh, and there's a new group in California starting up similar to that called the Hemp Investment Group. And it's basically taking these same angel investors that have been investing in cannabis and just investing in hemp and try matching them up with farmers and entrepreneurs. They're the investment people. They know that there's a big return on investment, but you know they're looking for strictly hemp deals and uh, you know uh, cannabis less than 0.3 percent, so that's a legal crop. And it's it's just a it's a, a a huge opportunity now because if you're a, a CBD hemp farmer. You, all you have to do is go to the county agricultural commissioner, fill out a one-page form, give them, pay a $900 annual fee, and then you can grow hemp. You gotta get it tested before you can harvest it to make sure it's less than 0.3% in hemp, but you can grow one acre, 10 acres, 100 acres, or 1,000 acres, and there's no additional taxes. It's just like potatoes or tomatoes, but this other industry, which is run through the Bureau of Cannabis Control, if it's, if it's medical marijuana, you get got a license, you pay thousands of dollars in taxes and fees, and you can only grow 100 acres. So that's why people, farmers, and in investors are moving to the CBD uh, industry in the, because there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. It's regulated, there's a moat around the industry, but once you can get past the moat, there's a, a lot of money to be made. Thank you, Brian. Jeff, you want to add a yeah, couple thing, comments? The thing that I would say is um, a couple things. One is if, you know, using his scenario, the one thing you want to keep in mind is if you have an existing banking relationship with an institution that's not banking him, if they discover you've, you've got 10 acres or five acres, you really, it could create a problem with the current environment. There are a number of banks, farm credit included, that are in the policy process of redoing their policies so that they can allow for hemp. I think a lot of that's gonna play out near the end of this year, possibly first quarter next year. So I would say always check with your financial institution first. The second thing I would point out is with the way the regulatory environment is written right now for banking, if you have an owner of your crop or you decide to set up a separate entity that's just gonna handle this little hemp and you have an investor that's coming in to help fund that. If you have an owner that has any ties to marijuana or medicinal marijuana, a bank can't touch you. So in some cases, it's if the ownership is you know below 20% or below 10%, I can tell you from Bank of the West, Anytime there's any affiliation with cannabis, it's a lot of paperwork. It's a meeting with a whole bunch of compliance people. And I'd say I got a 25% chance of getting an approval. So it is a big, it's still a big internal step. Now we've got great progress on the legislative front with the Safe Banking Act getting through the House. Goes to the Senate next and then Trump needs to sign off on it. We'll see how that plays out, but if that legislation does get signed, that will level the playing field for marijuana, hemp, CBD, and, and I think all the banks will begin to really wrap their hands around getting a policy in place that allows for banking all of it and trying to get the cash out of these companies and into a safer environment for them to operate in. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Brian, you touched upon a very important point, uh, that's taxation. As a small business owner, I hate paying taxes. As a local politician, I adore taxes because we have to make ends meet. So taking, again, the same question a level further, from a development perspective, no more agriculture. Now we're looking into the industrial manufacturing portion of hemp. What have you heard? What have you seen? Uh, what is trending both locally and nationally? Um, in terms of taxes? No, sir. In terms of actual, the next level. So you've got the raw material that is going to be converted into a finished good. What have you heard from that raw material being converted into a finished good for retail, for, from a retail perspective, 
both locally and at the national level? Okay, well, um, so locally there are some places that have been set up that, you know, that are doing business in CBD um, topical things. Like I got a, you know, a good friend of mine, he's got a factory in Sacramento. He, he makes CBD creams and pain relieving things like that. And uh, he, uh, he is, uh, the opportunity for him, he's been selling mostly through cannabis dispensaries now, but the, uh, the big drug company uh, retailers, Walgreens, CVS, uh, and some uh, supermarkets have announced plans to put this stuff on the shelf. And I've heard, you know, an ad, you can go, there's like an industry uh, publication called the Hemp Industry Daily, you know, and they have like stories about Walgreens and CVS announcing that they're gonna put these hemp products on the shelf. Not the edible products, not the CBD and water or energy drinks, but the CBD and creams and pain relieving things, they're ready to put them on, on the shelf. And I've, CBD, CVS drug stores had this thing where apparently they, they did like an experiment and put it on the shelf and they had people like lined up, you know, which is, nobody's ever heard of that, lining up in a drug store to buy, you know, anything really you know uh so there's that there there is uh there's that you know and you just pay your sales tax basically you pay your, your sales tax if you're a manufacturer you pay your business tax uh but there is no uh unlike the taxes that are going through um, marijuana and the state bureau of cannabis control and this, the different cities that are saying, okay, we can open up a, uh, a cannabis dispensary in our city, but we're gonna have so many taxes per dollar or taxes per square foot. There is none of that in, in hemp. There's no extra taxes that Walgreens or CVS or is gonna have to pay. It's, you'll just pay, if you're a distributor, you just pay your regular business tax, but there's no uh, ad additional tax. What I, what, I, what I was trying to reference is the fact that this is an emerging market. Uh, it's going to grow exponentially, hopefully within the next decade or two decades. There's going to be multiple opportunities for both, from an agricultural raw material perspective, the seed money or the seed product, moving forward to the work and process and the finished good that will go eventually to the end consumer, which is us, the public. And that's where I was really trying to trigger that question, the opportunities that you've seen based on your uh, expertise in the field of where you see this exponentially growing and what opportunities lie if you had a crystal ball moving forward? Well, okay. Loaded question, I, I, I realize yeah. that. So, so the, the, op the, the opportunity moving forward, and I, I had this spelled out, I, I, I issue a, a quarterly uh, market report on the California market, and I, I put them out on the tables here. There's some of these numbers in there. Um, but basically, you know, right, um, it's industrial hemp. That is, that is the future. It's this hemp for seed and for fiber. Right now, the three biggest companies in California selling seed and fiber are the Patagonia Mountaineering Company. They got hemp jeans. There's the Dr. Bronner's Soap Company. They got cold-pressed industrial hemp oil in their soap. And then there's uh, John Rulak with his uh, Nutiva food company, he's got uh, uh, hemp seed superfoods that he sells to like Trader Joe's and, and, and that kind of a thing. But basically, that's just the beginning. Basically, we will, what we'll have in the future in not too many years is we'll have Levi Strauss. And they will sell either 100% hemp jeans or 50-50 hemp cotton jeans. And everybody in the planet is not gonna wonder where they're their dad's old blue jeans. They're going to wonder when this 100% hemp cool blue jeans. And then you'll have c companies like Starbucks. Uh, they will be making their paper coffee cups with hemp fiber. Uh, right now, you can't recycle a, a Starbucks cup because it has a little tiny plastic film uh, inside the cup, and um, that you know to keep the coffee from leaking out. But in the future, you'll have a hemp fiber cup, and then you'll have a hemp bioplastic lid on your Starbucks or any kind of coffee cup, and that thin 
hemp bioplastic will be the film inside the coffee cup. And then you'll have, you know, the hemp building materials. You can go on YouTube and, and look at, you know, uh, videotapes of this hempcrete uh, um, stuff, and they, they, they take these hempcrete bricks and they put a blowtorch to it. And it gets red, but it doesn't burst into flames. It's like fire, flame-resistant building materials, which is just what California needs. And, you know, I, I try and say there's like a thousand products you can make out of hemp. There's actually 10,000 products, but it's such a huge figure, but, you know, but there's, you know, a couple of dozen that are on the market right now, and it's just going to get, it's just going to get bigger, and it's, it's just, an, it's a, a point in history. It's a new, green, sustainable industry, and there's no downside at all. It's good for the environment, it's good for the state, it's good for the counties, it's good for the consumer, it's good for the investors, it's, there, there's no downside at all. It's, you know, it's a great place to be right well, now. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Jeff, you want to chime and in? I can, I can tell you from a banker's perspective, um, every day I'm getting calls from private equity funds, major corporations that are talking about projects, products, research that they're funding for, for products to come. And what they're waiting for is if it's a consumable side product, they're waiting for the FDA to come out with their guidelines. If it's a manufactured product, they're waiting for USDA to come out with their national kind of guideline on what the growing um, protocols are gonna be that they're gonna adopt from one of the states and basically map it across for everybody. Um, there is a lot of money and research and products that are just waiting on the sidelines for this industry sector to pass its birth stage. And, and right now it's extremely fragmented, as many of you know, we've got counties and states passing legislation weekly and very little of it is consistent. So that is what is keeping the big corporates and a lot of um, strategic partnerships that are already being mapped out and developed um, for, I'm told, 25,000 different products that they know of today. And, you know, we're seeing it in the biofuels space, we're seeing it in the, in the whole plastic space, we're seeing it in the building industry, because hemp doesn't mold and it's anti-bacterial. Um, we're seeing it in the, the clothing sector, healthcare, pharma. They're just beginning to map out the CBD molecule and, and figure out all the different things that it can do to the human body, and it's gonna take a while to work through that. Um, so the, you know, it's, it's like looking at us right now and just looking at the tip of your, your pinky finger. That's what we see today, but there's more coming, and it's not just in the U.S., it's, it's, it's global. So um, it's, the crystal ball is very bright. Again, it's an emerging market. It makes millionaires billionaires, and I'm just hoping to be a millionaire, let alone a billionaire. But anyway, that's a separate matter altogether. Uh, I'm going to touch upon uh, what you just talked about. You kind of jumped into one of my questions to you is, uh, if you look at the cannabis industry, besides retail, you've got the big four of cultivation, manufacturing, testing, and distribution. So you break the cannabis out of the equation and you replace it with uh, hemp from a strictly non-agricultural, but more from a manufacturing industrial perspective. Again, you've got the big four as an example that I use, cultivation, manufacturing, testing, and distribution. More from a manufacturing, testing, and distribution perspective as either wholesale or retail product. Where, from a banking perspective, does Bank of the West stand, and what have you heard from other banking institutions? Specifically, again, not from a cultivation, but more on the other aspects to take it to the open market? Well, I think um, I, I have a little different perspective and it's because I work for a global bank. For those who don't know, Bank of the West is wholly owned by BNP, headquartered in Paris, sixth largest bank in the world, 72 countries. So we're banking hemp and cannabis and CBD and in other countries and have for years and it's being used for everything from 
car bodies to you know f it replacing plastic um, to you know biofuels uh, animal feed I mean it's just it goes on and on and on so I think given the US has now legalized it from a manufacturing perspective um, again I, I my view is and what I'm hearing from others is the outlook is is really off the charts and what 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 makes it so attractive is right now when you look at the, um, I guess, profile of, of consumers and the new consumers entering the market, uh, there is this shift occurring towards a more environmentally, socially responsible um, purchasing habit, doing things that are gonna sustain our environment. And when you look at hemp and the fact that it's biodegradable and you look at the things that it can replace that are literally toxic for our environment and for the employees that have to have to be part of the manufacturing process. Um, there is a willingness of big corporations to invest lots of money for private wealth growth um, reasons, but also because there is much more transparency now into those corporations, into how they're behaving, how they're doing research, what are they doing to contribute? And it's driving investment dollars, it's driving um, uh, you know, uh, news attention. So you know, we're finding major corporate clients are looking for ways to be more socially conscious, more environmentally conscious, and when you look at hemp and the current capabilities of it, you, you, you don't find a, a better product really on the market that has a great social environmental profile that has just not been leveraged, but can be leveraged in so many ways. Brian, you want to add anything to that? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, hemp is a green, sustainable you know uh crop and it's it's just a you know there's all kinds of like really like hemp crazy hippies out there that have been saying hemp is going to save the world for a, you know like a long time uh turns out it's true i mean i thought it was when i heard about medical marijuana i said you know this is just you know silly this is just like an, an excuse you know for marijuana but then it turns out it's true. It actually, medical marijuana cure, cures epilepsy in kids. Medical marijuana, you know, you know it does good things for post-traumatic stress system. You know, you talk to seniors, they got aches and pains. It really helps, you know, with them. It's, you know, it, it, it's true. And so CBD is a little bit like, you know, vitamin C. Vitamin C, uh, is good for a cold, it does not cure the common cold. But if you got a cold, take vitamin C. CBD does not cure cancer, but it, it really is medicine and it, and it really does good things. There was a Super Bowl ad that uh, got turned down by a very smart company, CBD company, that created the ad and said, can we put it on the Super Bowl? And they said no. And so that story about them saying no went viral, and then people saw the ad on YouTube, uh, the ad that didn't get on the Super Bowl, and it shows, you know, pri Corporal Ryan, you know, who's missing a leg, you know, from uh, the wars in the Middle East, you know, using CBD. It shows this mother and father with their kid who are using CBD, and it, you know, and it's just an amazing thing. That is where the market is going. Uh, you, it'll be maybe three, four years, but industrial hemp will be on the Super Bowl ads. Everybody remembers the California raisins, right? The dancing raisins, right? So it's, it's not gonna be the Colorado nuggets, it's gonna be the California hemp co-op. It'll be, you know, 100, 300, 500 hemp farmers in California, all in a co-op, promoting the California hemp brand, you know, and marketing their product just like Sunkist, uh, you know, does, 
and uh, the, you know, so that's where the market will be going. And then it's, you know, people will be buying it in Walgreens and Safeway. They'll be buying it, you know, hemp, hemp tree free paper in Office Depot. You know, and then the the corporations that want the to do the right thing and the corporate social responsibility, you know, image, they're going to be buying more industrial hemp products, whether it's you know biofuel, bioplastic, tree free paper, whatever it is. It's um, you know, it's just it's it's a uh, it's just a developing market, and it's just gonna you know it's it's just gonna get bigger. But that's where the future is. Hemp, California hemp co-op, farmer ads on the Super Bowl, and whatever brand, whatever kind of char cartoon character they use to promote California hemp. That's where the market's going. Thank you, Brian. Last question. Crystal ball time. I'm going to relate this to a banking analogy. Not all banks do construction lending because there's an inherent risk to construction lending. Hemp financing. When do you think we'll break that barrier? So I want you to dig into your crystal ball. Is it going to be in six months, a year, two years, when hemp will be uh, something bankable? And by bankable, it means we're going to be able to open up DDA accounts. We're going to be able to offer lines of credit. We're going to be offer, able to offer long-term financing for, for construction or term financing for actual manufacturing of the, uh, of the product. Again, looking into your crystal ball based on your experience, when do you think we'll be able, be able to break that barrier where the banking industry is open to hemp producers, hemp suppliers, hemp manufacturers, et cetera? Um, I think the Safe Banking Act that's just passed is, is going to be. I apologize. That's my banking background. DDAs are checking accounts, just for the record. I just realized I said DDAs. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Jeff. So demand deposit accounts, otherwise known as DDAs or checking accounts, um, I think it's right around the corner. Um, we've been doing it since January. I'm sh I know of other institutions that are in the space that are regional or, or smaller um, organizations. I know there's a lot of banks that are talking about it. Um, they just, they're, they're talking about it, so they haven't gotten there yet. I think, I think the major institutions on the depository side will get there, um, probably across the board by the first quarter, second quarter of next year. Um, in terms of the lending side, we now have a crop insurance plan for 2020. Um, I don't know how many growers are going to be able to qualify for it, but the fact that we have an insurance mechanism on the crop puts the bank in a position to where we can lend for you to grow the crop because if you've got insurance. So that is a, a big step and they've got that in place for 2020. Um, I think in terms of doing more long-term financing like uh, farm ground purchases, um, equipment purchases where you're looking at somewhere between, you're looking at a multi-year bank commitment for the loan in terms of repayment that's tied to growing or processing hemp, um, the, way, the way it's gonna work is, the way we've done many other new crops is, you guys come in with your projections on how much you're gonna make uh, and, in growing and selling the crop. We know you've gotten crop insurance, so we know you're gonna be able to at least cover your costs. And then what we do is we look at the revenue projection you're building into your budget and we stress test the heck out of it. We say, what level can they fall, can the revenue fall down to, to where they can still service the debt? So if you're having, as you, as this develops, that's the way you want to approach that conversation with your banker is to say, based on my revenue projection off the farm, you know, I can, I only need to make 30% of this projection to cover my debt service. And, and that's what bankers are going to be focusing on and will get us from where we are today going, I can't bet anything at all on hemp or hemp related um, to where we're willing to start putting our toes in the pond on the debt side. Now, what we are seeing today is, you know, old school financing. It's partnerships. Got a big grower. They reach out to a processor because they want to build a processing facility 
processor says, I need the hemp, let's partner. I'll bring the equipment and install it on your farm and you're gonna grow the crop and give me a spot to put the equipment on your farm and we're gonna own it 50-50 or 60-40 or whatever the number is. In some cases, we've got farmers that are saying, I don't want any of the CBD risk. Um, I'll grow the crop for you, processor. And processor, processor says we can do it two ways. I can give you the seed, you can grow the crop, and then I'll pay you a, a profitable rate for the crop when it's completed. Or we can share in it and you can buy the seed but you get a much bigger share of the upside when I process it and you're not paying me a processing fee. So I mean, there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. The, the bottom line is right now there is a whole lot more demand than there is supply. So if you're a grower, you're part of that supply that, that everybody's looking for. So, you know, I think it's, it's a good conversation to have. It, I'm, I've seen many, many clients and prospects um, work through equipment projects, large and small, um, but it's a, a lot of joint ventures and partnerships with entities that are a little further up the food chain that need that supply or have access to the market and they've got contracts in place with fixed pricing and so they, they want to work with people. So that's a, a lot of what I'm seeing on the financing side today, I think that will continue for the next year. The, the United States has to sort out um, the regulatory side on the, on the USDA side for growers and the FDA side for CBD companies that are looking to sell to anyone beyond a non-human consuming it. Um, yeah, so right now, in California, this is our first growing season. And it's, things are more mature. We're in other states where they've been growing for many years, like Colorado since 2012, Oregon. Uh, Kentucky is actually, you know, drove uh, the, uh, the market, which is uh, heavily influenced by politics. So it was Mitch McConnell in the Senate and his, the people in his state the Kentucky tobacco growers, you know, they said, we're struggling, you know, this, we want you to legalize hemp. And he said, okay, I got like, you know, a couple thousand, you know, small business ag people here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna champion this thing where, you know, it's, it's a good thing for everybody. We're just gonna push it through because it's, it's common sense. So they did that years before in Canada. So the United States is gonna follow the, the Canada process in that first hemp was legal throughout Canada, coast to coast. Now, marijuana is legal coast to coast through Canada. With marijuana being legal, it just makes, you know, the hemp industry a lot easier, right? So what's gonna happen in the near future is we're gonna have the 2020 presidential election. Two years after that, we're gonna have the 2022 congressional midterm elections. And in the congr those congressional midterm elections, everybody for running for Congress is going to have to take a position on legalizing marijuana for adult use for 21 and over. Probably there'll be a statewide ballot initiative like they had in California in New York State uh, in 2020 during the presidential, and that'll pass. That's the other big state. So many millions of people, consumers will be, because. Uh, New York wants the, 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 the taxes and the revenue that California is getting from this adult use marijuana industry. So what's going to happen is 2023, uh, you'll see the United States following the, Can the Canadian model where hemp is legal coast to coast and, the, and then marijuana is legal. And now it's, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, it's just like uh, beer and wine, you know, uh, kind of a thing. And people are growing. Um, you know, uh, hops and wheat and, you know, and things like that. But, uh, so that, so there's, hemp will be increasingly, uh, you know, uh, there'll be less of a moat. Right now there's a moat, which is a good thing. I mean, it's a good thing and a bad thing. 
it's a all this regulation and all this you know laws and all this you know you know nonsense it's one it's a pain in the ass but two if you can figure out how to get through it then you're then you're in the game so right now there's 300 registered farmers in California growing uh, about 20,000 acres by the time the California Department of Food and Agriculture finishes the reporting for this year, it'll probably be 400 growers growing 30,000 acres in California. But it's not 3,000 farmers growing 300,000 acres. There's like a moat. You have to know a little bit about the law and how it works. You don't have to know how to fill out the form. You know, at the County Agriculture Commissioner, you have to know a little bit about the industry. Once you know that, you know, then, so it cuts both ways. The, you know, the, 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 the hassle and, and, and the nonsense around the rules and regulation is a hassle, but it also protects you from everybody, you know, uh, being, you know, being, in the, being uh, in the industry. And it'll continue to be regulated, just like the county is not going to let an unlimited amount of sand and gravel companies do business in the county. There's wear and tear on the roads, you're digging into the mountain, they're going to regulate it. They're going to say, okay, we're only going to have a limited amount of, you know, uh, and you, we've already seen that in some counties. It says, okay, we got 100 people registered in the county already to grow hemp. We're going to stop the registration process because we don't have the staff to go out and test these fields. You know, we got we got to take this you know thing one at a time. So it's, um, but that's the the future is that you know it will, the United States will follow the Canadian model, and it'll just become you know eventually it'll be just like growing tomatoes. Well, that's the other thing is you, you're growing tomatoes, you're growing on contract. If you're growing tomatoes for the company that wants to buy the tomatoes, they're either making tomato sauce or they're making ketchup. And they're telling you what kind of tomatoes I want to buy, what the price is going to be. So, you know, as the marketing in California matures, the market will be growing on contract. So you'll be growing industrial hemp, CBD hemp uh, on contract. And then you'll be grouping with other farmers in, you know, in a, in a, in a uh, co-op so that you can negotiate with the big buyers, you know, the best price possible kind of a thing, and then you'll be uh, taking some of your revenue and sharing it to do a joint marketing thing for the, for the state brand. Thank you, Brian. I could really use a beer. Uh, wearing a jacket here at 5 p.m. gets kind of hot. But anyway, we have time for a couple questions before we head to uh, the uh, aftermarket. Uh, any questions? We've got a few minutes for some questions. Chair, come on, give us a question. Stand, Challenges. We're standing between them and the beverage. I wouldn't be asking. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. I apologize. <laughs> no questions from the audience. One question. I think there's mics in designated locations. Or just scream. Or you can scream. That's true. The state of it now is that it's you know it's pretty mature in Colorado and Oregon. You know. The, uh, the Oregon hemp farmers, uh, you know, know uh, the biomass buyers, and the biomass buyers kind of know the Oregon hemp growers. Um, there is a new, there is a company, an online company called Hemp Exchange, and there's other companies coming up with this model. But basically, the Hemp Exchange out of uh, HempExchange.com out of uh, Oregon, they are screening the growers. They're going to say, okay. You want to say you want to go onto our online platform and find a buyer. Show us your license to grow in the county. Let us know how many. Give us the information about your business, and then they do the same thing with the with the uh, biomass buyers. They say, show us your license. You know, give us the details about your business, and then they put them together online. They say, I'm a farmer. I got a thousand. Uh, pounds of uh, CBD biomass that's 10% CBD and I want to sell it. And then you got a buyer saying, okay, I want to buy 20,000 pounds of CBD biomass. It has to be at least, you know, 5% CBD level and this is the price per pound that I want to pay. And then that hemp exchange company will take 6%. Uh, 
They'll take 3% from the buyer, 3% from the seller for doing the work that they do, you know, uh, doing the screening to make sure that these are legitimate buyers and sellers. And then they help out a little bit with the, the trucking and the logistics. And there, there's other people who are starting up these kinds of uh, matchmaking things, but they, uh, the buyer and seller market and growing on contract is more mature in the states that have been doing it for a while like uh, Colorado and, and uh, Nevada and uh, Kentucky and places like that. I would, I would echo uh, his comments. From my perspective, looking at probably 50 companies that are in the space that, that grew hemp this summer, um, I would say 90 plus percent had a grow contract up front before they put anything in the ground. Um, and in most cases, if it was just a pure uh, farming entity, they were growing under a contract where the party that wanted the hemp grown provided the seed, so there was very little risk to the farm, and there was either a revenue share or a flat fee being paid for the crop. And in some cases, the company that was contracting for the crop was providing all the harvesting and providing farm management guidance, given in most cases it was farmers' first time growing the crop on their property. Um, in Oregon and Colorado, uh, given they've been growing for a number of years, um, almost everybody that I see is growing is under a contract that's been in place for more than a year. And the acreage might be changing slightly. Um, I've seen some. Uh, joint ventures between the farming um, uh, company and a publicly traded or major corporate entity that wants to have complete control over the source from farm to finished product so they can have complete traceability and they've got an ownership stake in that farm that they advertise you know, on the internet and their website when they made the purchase to again demonstrate back to the consumer that we are a closed loop you know, provider. We control the quality of the crop, the CBD, it's organic, it's traced all the way back to the day it's harvested and we can tell you who touched it all along the way. It's that consumer accountability, almost a food grade traceability back to the crop. And I think we will see more of that as once the FDA gets the, their policies in place, the food side as it's looking at CBD as an ingredient, is gonna need 100% traceability all the way back, which means they're either gonna be contracting with a grower that can deliver the level of reporting and crop traceability that is required in the food space. So, um, so I, I think um, the state of the industry is today is that given most of the farmers have never grown it before, it's being Contracts are a critical component, and you're getting more than just a contract from the buyer um, in terms of guiding you through growing the crop, perhaps providing inputs, perhaps I've seen them covering 100% of growing costs. So you as a farmer, all you have is ground and time, and you're even charging for your time to produce the crop. So it's, it's really, and, and many of these entities, again, it comes back to they need the supply, they need to train more farmers, how to grow it. So in many cases, what I would tell you is if you're looking at getting into the space, the first step is to figure out who you're comfortable partnering with. Do not do it on your own or speculation, growing the crop all by yourself that you're gonna find someone to sell it to. Find your buyer first and do it on a risk program that you're comfortable with and you're not betting the farm. And the market is, is there, and it's getting more and more established every single day. Um, and it really comes down to you know, your ability to demonstrate your capability to deliver whatever they need to have done. Thanks, Jeff. We have time for one more question. Go ahead. Sorry, Victor. I really want a beer. Hello. Thank you guys uh, for coming today.
constructing it. You know, once uh, they get their FSA loan or micro loan, you know, they'd like to pay with banks or, or work with you. Who should I have servicemen and women contact, you know, in your institution? I'm already chairman of the board for your agribusiness oh. dean's advisory board. So nice. I'll be on campus in a couple weeks, and I just learned that, you know, you came on board and. We've got to, it's something I've been pushing for with Cal Poly Pomona for some time because it's a hands-on ag school and it's a perfect research farm. It's a perfect format for um, doing what's needed in the sector. So you can contact me. Being, being a former banker, I can tell you 100%, with 100% certainty, that once the legalization is 100% uh, open and there is no... Uh, there's no gray area, uh, a number of banks will jump into the open market. Absolute, Why? Absolutely. Because it's going to provide liquidity. Absolutely. Especially the smaller banks that need more liquidity. So I can guarantee you that within a calendar year, you're going to have multiple banks competing with Bank of the West for hemp customers. And we need it. I mean, there's so much opportunity here that I'm, af I'm afraid sitting here because every day I get a phone call from somebody saying my bank doesn't bank it yet. And it's like, I, you know, we've got to get more of the financial institutions understanding what hemp is, understanding what CBD is, you know, along with the general public. So, um, amen. <laughs> you want to add anything, uh, um, Brian? I'm kind of a, um, I'm like the CEO and janitor at my own little hemp <laughs> empire. Here, but uh, so you, you can feel free to call me anytime. The good thing about me is I got like no wife, no kids, no dog, and currently no girlfriend. So I got plenty of time, to, and I like what I do. I like talking to people about business and you know uh, and this kind of a thing. Anyway, so my my two four three eight nine zero zero. That's actually my home office and cell wherever I am uh, in California. But I, I do work with teams of people. So I, I do work with, uh, you know, investment teams, and I work with uh, uh, the Hemp Industry Association, and, and I, I know the different uh, uh, groups that are uh, working uh, in concert to develop this uh, industry. And uh, this is just an amazing thing, I mean, that uh, this gathering here, that there is a, uh, a county uh, economic development uh, organization that is, has the foresight and the vision to, you know, put on a hemp conference and summit, you know, which is going to, you know, which is literally positioning Imperial County as like, you know, the leading county <laughs> in the in the state. I got this statewide expo happening in Fresno in November, but but this is an amazing thing. When I heard that there was like four or five hundred tickets sold and fifty vendors in Imperial County, I said. You know, I'm coming down to the, you know, I don't care, you know, how far it is. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be there. Thank you. Thank um, you. Ready to rock and roll? Let's give uh, Brian Webster from California Hemp and Jeff Birch from uh, Bank of the West a uh, round of applause, please. got a raffle right before we leave. Uh, these are for the red tickets that they're coming in. So we've got four, uh, four prizes.